death was arrested and my life was made free. What wonderful words, what wonderful thoughts for us to be thinking of. First off, I want to, my wife said, make sure that you go and tell people that if you've gone through abortion or been involved with it in any way, make sure people know that death has been arrested and their life is set free. That's the biggest thing to remember from this message. God forgives. John MacArthur, when he was talking, he has to preach at several services. And he said that he preached on abortion. And after the first service, one of his elders came up and said, you need to hit that point hard. Because there is people that went out of church crying and sobbing. Because they had gone through abortions or been involved. And they were like, what's the hope? But there is hope. It's Friday, Jesus in the grave, but it's sun, Sunday's coming. And for us, Sunday is here. <clears throat> so you might be thinking, boy, how do you tie in neighbor with abortion? And I was like surprised when I first heard that joining together of neighbor with abortion. I like the sign in the middle, women deserve the truth. But this is our whole country deserves the truth. What I had heard was that a number of Jewish people do not feel that abortion is wrong. I really like listening to Ben Shapiro, an Orthodox Jew, talk about pro-life causes. He has to be one of the best apologists when it comes to the pro-life position from a Jewish perspective. I'd heard that Jews do not feel that abortion is wrong. But when you go and you look at the history, you find out that the reality is that the pagan nations around Israel thought abortion was perfectly fine. The pagan nations around Israel thought that sex and identifying with the sexual identity was a good thing. The Greeks, the Romans, they had no problems, but the Jews did have problems with abortion. Their problem was they felt that you should not hurt your neighbor. You needed to love your neighbor as yourself. And they said, what neighbor is closer than the unborn child? That the unborn child is the neighbor of the woman. And I thought, that makes good sense. I need to go ahead and talk about that. My closest neighbor is the unborn child. And that I need to go ahead and be loving that unborn child in the same way that I love myself. So when you go and you look, the Jews thought abortion was wrong. The Jews thought that the unborn child was a creation created by God. The Jews went and thought, that this was somebody that needed to be protected in contrast to the surrounding countries. The early church took up that same position that the unborn child needed to be protected, that the unborn child was a unique creation of God. But our world has gone astray. Our world has turned from this perspective to one to think that the unborn child is an inconvenience the unborn child is something that gets in the way. We need to go ahead and be reaching out to our country, to the people around us. Back on, <clears throat> so this was when uh, Roe versus Wade being overturned was announced on June 24th, a Friday. That Saturday, I ended up getting an email from the Department of State for Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Now, it's unusual for me to get an email from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania on any day of the week, but especially a Saturday. I don't think those guys work past Friday at about, what, noon or something? If you work for the state, the Commonwealth, I'm sorry. Um, but anyway, they sent out this email on a Saturday, 
And what it said was, don't worry, we got your back. It was, abortion is still legal in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and both clinics and doctors will not be prosecuted or suffer. You don't have to worry about any fear of prosecution because abortion is legal in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I was like, how sad. So going to Mark 12, 30 to 32, I'm just gonna read 31. The second commandment is, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Love your neighbor as yourself. I would think, how many people does this apply to? This applies both to the unborn child, it applies to that mother that's worried about this pregnancy, it applies to the family, it applies to the father. I wanna go and talk a little bit about how critical it is for us to be thinking of the men. A Christian call to pro-life action is a call for the children of light, and I hope that you're a child of the light, to be who they are in Christ. Christians who walk in the light must expose the dark and fruitless works of abortion. The murder of preborn children is a dark and barren work, and God, God calls his people to expose it. That's from John Piper. Back in the 1850s, the states were divided between slave states and free states. And when new states were coming into the Union, it was a question of, are they going to be a slave state or are they going to be a free state? How are they going to control the balance of power? In some ways, sounds like our debates about who's going to control the balance of power in the Senate and the Congress. Who's going to control the balance of power in the Supreme Court and the other courts in the land? Who's going to control the balance of power in the different states? But people, Christians, stood up to slavery and said, slavery is wrong. All people are created in the image of God. All people are valuable. We need to go and be encouraging those around us in the same manner that all people, whoever my neighbor is, pre-born or already born, invalid or functioning very well, all of these people are created in the image of God. And all of these people deserve respect and love. That we need to change the opinion of our culture from being a slave culture, a culture that thinks murder is okay, to a culture that says it is critical to value the pre-born, those that are alive, and those that are at the end of life. So I'd like to encourage you on a couple of things. Number one, consider abortion murder. Why should you consider that? Because scripture says abortion is murder. Abortion can be compared to slavery. We go and we feel that people are saying, hey, this is an unborn child. I can do with it whatever I want. It is my biological material to deal with in whatever manner I want. I have the right to choose whether it lives or dies. I'd like to encourage you that the battle scene has now changed. Many of us were thinking that when Roe versus Wade was tossed out, that the battle would suddenly be everything set free. Abortion would be outlawed. But people quickly came to realize that it was now a matter of going from state to state to state. But I would like to go and say it's a matter of going from community to community to community and most importantly, going from person to person to person. You're going to have people in the Senate testifying and saying that people that are capable of being pregnant can't even bring themselves to saying it's women and arguing about abortion for people that are capable of being pregnant. Till we go and we have things going on in Massachusetts where individual cities are banning pro-life clinics because they say they are not telling the truth, that they are being dishonest in the way they present things. I would submit that it's even a matter of we need to go and be talking to the people around us. The 
president of <clears throat> CareNet said that when they've done a survey of both men, of women that show up at CareNet clinics, and of the women that show up, they asked him, who's the most influential person in this decision to have an abortion or not? And his answer was, when we asked that of the men, the men said, I am. I'm the one that's most influential in this decision. When they went and they've asked that question of the women, the women responded, it's the man that's most important in this decision. I would go and submit that as we go and we take the battle to our neighbors, that we're going to have to go and reconsider who we're taking the battle to. But as we do take this battle, we need to go and show, show the love of Christ. We need to reflect Christ in all that we do. I want to tell you about Telemachus, who showed the love of Christ about 1600, 1,600 years ago. Telemachus was a monk that traveled from Eastern Europe to Rome. Telemachus was thinking that he was going to be coming to the center of Christianity and that this would be a wonderful opportunity. As he shows up in Rome, he gets swept into, uh, some people say the Colosseum, other people say just a stadium, but he ended up getting swept into a place where there were gladiator fights going on. Now in 404 AD, gladiator fights had been banned about 70 to 100 years prior to this. However, the leaders found that it was politically wise to allow gladiator fights to continue. This was for several different reasons, but the people liked their gladiator fights. So even though it was banned, they still allowed the gladiator fights to continue. Telemachus shows up there and finds this one gladiator standing over top of another about ready to run him through with a sword. Telemachus runs down from the stands and jumps into the ring, yelling to the crowd, forbear, forbear, in the name of Christ, forbear. He wants to put a stop to this horrific scene that he sees in front of him. There's two endings to the story. Actually, there'd be three. But the two main endings were that he was knocked to the ground and the referee gave him a thumbs down and he was run through by the sword. The more common variation of the story is that the crowd picked up stones and stoned Telemachus because they did not want to hear what Telemachus had to say. Forbear, forbear, in the name of Christ, forbear. So the crowd picks up stones and killed Telemachus. The good news was, though, the Caesar heard the story, and the very next day, he banned the gladiator fights. So even though technically gladiator fights had been illegal for about 70 years, on January 2nd, 4004, gladiator, bite, gladiator fights occurred no longer. One man was willing to go and stand up and to say, in the name of Christ, forbear, forbear. What a unique way to argue. He didn't go and grab the sword from the gladiator and try to attack the gladiator that was attacking the lesser man, but he was willing to stand there himself and then died as a result. This is a picture of the number of abortions done in the US. Now this only shows part of the problem. While we're at about 950,000 abortions for ourselves here in the US, the WHO estimates there's about 73 million abortions committed around the world each year. 73 million. That's about one-fourth the population of the U.S. being killed each year 
by abortion worldwide. In the U.S., you can see that, well, the good news is the number of abortions has decreased from a high of about 1.6 million down to 930,000. The percentage, it has recently increased, though, and the percentage of pregnancies that end in abortion has also increased to 20%, one out of five. One out of five pregnancies in the U.S. end in abortion. The Gutemacher Institute is a research arm of Planned Parenthood, and they're the ones that actually have the best statistics on abortions. This is a graph that shows the number of abortions that are completed with medicines by giving the woman medication so that she then goes home and aborts the child. You can see that now it's up to about 50% of all abortions are done with medicines. Why would this be a critical number? This goes back to we're now going to have to talk to our neighbors. In the past, you could go and stand outside an abortion clinic, pray, sing, counsel people as they were coming into the clinic, and hopefully divert some of those people. Now the person can get the medication over the phone, through the mail, and you're not going to be able to stand out. You don't know whose house to stand outside to intercept the mailman and say, in the name of Christ, forbear. We have to go and be involved more intimately with individuals in order to make an effective um, stand against abortion. And again, we need to make an effective stand to the men that are 18 to 24 that are the group that are most in favor of abortion. So the big thing is, when does the moment of life occur? When does the human become a human? People say, well, the Bible doesn't say anything about it. Science will go and tell me, well, you know, this and that. People will go and say, well, it's when the person is wanted. When the person is able to, you know, make it on their own. Well, according to that, my wife would say, there's no way Gary's going to make it on his own. <laughs> so, you know, we need to go and be saying, what is the moment of life? And I would like to go and say, the Bible speaks quite clearly on that. Psalm 127.3, children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. It's important to realize life begins at the moment of conception. The message, I'm going to show this slide in a little bit, states it even more explicitly. So the big thing that differentiates us from animals is our soul. When do you actually get a soul? Is it something you get at the time when you pass through the birth canal, birth canal when you're born? Or is it something that occurs prior to that? I would go and submit that as humans, we can transmit physical features with the sperm and the ovum but we cannot make a soul. That at the time of conception, when the physical factors come together, God has to impart the soul. In Psalm 104, verse 30, we read, Thou dost send forth thy spirit, they are created. God is the one that places the spirit, the soul, in the body. God has the ability to open and close wombs. Multiple times in the scripture we read about women praying for children, husbands praying for children. We go on, we read in Genesis 20, 17 to 18. This is Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech, his wife and his maidservants, and they started having babies again. For God had shut down every womb in Abimelech's household on account of Sarah, Abraham's wife. We read in Genesis 16, 2. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. 
So Sarai, Abram's wife, went and did some foolish things, but they acknowledge the Lord was the one that had kept her from having children. But then we also can read about where God opens the womb. In 1 Samuel, this is uh, 1, 5 through 6, we had Hannah, and she was praying that the Lord had closed, because the Lord had closed her womb. Um, you remember that when she was standing before, um, I'm blanking now on the name of the priest at that time. Elijah, yeah, thank you. That, um, you know, he was wondering, why are you, you know, you sound like a drunk woman. And she was like, because I'm praying to the Lord that my womb would be opened. <clears throat> And God does open the womb. God, God does allow conception. God does allow that life and the imparting of a soul. In Genesis 17, 6, we read, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. We read similar things in Genesis 17, 16, Genesis 25, 1 Samuel, in Ruth, Judges, especially like Ruth there. You know, that's a neat love story of how Boaz and Ruth ended up having a son. In Job, we read, You made me like handcrafted piece of pottery, and now are you going to smash me into pieces? I think about when I hear that smash you into pieces. One of the ways of abortion is a D&E, where you go and you dilate the cervix, go up and start pulling out body parts. That's what smashing a piece of, pe smashing a piece of pottery. Don't you remember how beautifully you worked my clay? Will you reduce me now to a mud pie? Oh, that marvel of conception as you stirred together semen and ovum. What a miracle of skin and bone, muscle and brain. You gave me life itself, incredible love. You watched and guarded every breath I took. It's not just David that goes and talks about how fearfully and wonderfully made I, I am. It's not just David that, just, that talks about how you were there as he was knit together in his mother's womb. Job goes and talks in a similar manner about how he's a fine piece of pottery. What a miracle of skin and bone, muscle and brain. The more I learn about the human body, the more I'm amazed. The more I learn about the human body, how it starts with chromosomes from the ovum, chromosomes from the sperm, to go and result in a new life, it's just amazing. The more I learn about how that baby develops inside the womb. It's just dramatic. Job 12, 7 to 10. But ask the animals, and they will teach you, and the, or the birds in the sky, and they will tell you. This says we're more foolish than the animals and the birds of the sky. We don't seem to know where we come from, who created us. Or speak to the earth, and, I will te and it will teach you. Let the fish in the sea inform you. Which of all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. We have breath because of God. In Job 31 and Job 33, we read similarly about how God opens the womb. In Psalm 22, you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you. Even when this was a baby suckling at the breast, it trusted in God. Psalm 100, know this, God is God and God, God. He made us, we didn't make him. I think there's some people in academia, in politics that need to learn that. God made us, we didn't make him. We're his people, his well-tended sheep. God imparts the spirit. God imparts the soul. In Psalm 104, 
Send out your spirit and they spring to life. The whole countryside is in bloom and blossom. So as Christians, we should rescue those who are being led away to death and hold them back from the slaughter. God's people must do something for the sake of life. It's critical for us to go ahead and to be, to be proclaiming that life begins at the moment of conception, that the preborn child is not just some biological material. The preborn child is somebody that has all the potential for life. So what can we do? And this list comes from Tim Counts, a pastor. I think he's in uh, Vermont. So he first says, pray. It's critical for us to pray. Pray that abortion, our prayers have been answered, that Roe versus Wade has been tossed out. Now we have to go and discuss this at the state level, the city and county level, and the individual level. So pray. Study the scriptures. Know what scripture has to say about these things. Share scripture and your story. Susan goes and tells the, the case of a person that had several abortions and as a result has had a dramatic stuttering problem ever since. People suffer in a lot of ways that you never hear about after having an abortion. Men also will go and suffer because they're the ones that oftentimes have convinced women to have abortions, that they rightly feel that they were an accomplice to a murder. Testify, write, write letters to the editor, visit your legislators. Let them know that you are pro-life and that you feel that life begins at the moment of conception. Support your local crisis pregnancy center. The needs are gonna become even greater now that Roe versus Wade has been overturned. We're gonna have more people that are going to be saying, what are my options? What can I do? The crisis pregnancy center is there to go and tell people about their options. One of the things I would go and say, though, is we also need to be encouraging people, hey, sex should be between a man and a woman that are married. That if we were to go ahead and encourage everybody to be responsible, men to be responsible, that we would go ahead and then not have many of the problems. There'd still be women that would be concerned about an unwanted pregnancy, even in marriage but it would decrease things dramatically. So, but the local crisis pregnancy center needs your support. Get involved with foster care and adoption. These areas are already a big need and they're gonna become bigger needs. Minister to women that have had abortions. These are hurting people. And I would go and submit that they oftentimes were hurt initially by the man that made them pregnant they then were hurt by the abortionist, and now they can be potentially hurt in the way people respond. These people need help. So most importantly, remember our duty to love. I would like to encourage you, we need to go and tell our society, abortion is like slavery, abortion is murder. We don't feel murder is correct. We need to, as a society, go and say abortion is wrong also. Abortion is murder. Abortion is detestable to God. As I read through the Old Testament, I keep reading about all these things that Israel did and how God found them detestable. But as I'm reading these things about what Israel did, I keep thinking about what America is doing. And I keep thinking that God has to find us detestable and be wanting to spit us out of his mouth. I'd like to encourage you, in the name of Christ, forbear. Let's pray. 
Lord, help us to go and look to you. Help us to uh, know your word well. Help us to proclaim your word well. And by proclaiming your word well, people would consider life that you have given to be sacred and not to be taken away by man. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.